Are you tired of listening to German language all day long? Don't you just want to get your news and topics presented in English, even though you live in Germany? Then here's your solution. Yeah! <laughs> Elephant in the Room, an English radio show where we discuss things that people tend to ignore. Tune in on Color Radio on 99.3 and 98.4 every second and fourth Monday of the month. Elephant in the Room, a radio show by the Black Rose Radio Collective from Dresden. Hate Mondays. Be organized. Stay cool. All right, welcome back to the elephant in the room. Today we are going to talk about Belarus and coronavirus situation in the country. Parallel to that, we will have some music from Belarusian punk band called I Know. Today in our radio show, we have a friend from Belarus, the person who comes from the place where there is actually no COVID-19. And we are really happy to have you here. Hello, how are you? Hey, hey, nice to hear from you. And I'm happy to share with you some information, which is actually not true that there's no COVID-19, <laughs> just <laughs> according to our government. Okay, that's good. At least that's why we're here to talk about what is actually really happening. And there were other places where people tried to pretend that there is no COVID, but eventually it turned out that even if... You Everybody died in these places and we cannot hear from them anymore, right? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> kind of. But yeah, maybe you can give us an overview or kind of impressions about what is going on in Belarus right now at the moment. And since when is there actually like COVID appeared in the in your place and yeah what how was the government dealing with that like how did it appear that Belarus is now in the media all around the world again because Lukashenko <laughs> wanted to be a bit more I think he needed attention right 
uh, I think he needed just to not lose the money. <laughs> um, well, so to start with, uh, the first case uh, that was registered was on uh, February 27th. Uh, it was uh, registered with, an, uh, with a student who studies here in Minsk uh, and comes from Iran. And I have to remind that back then Iran used to be like the the center of the pandemic together with Italy. So basically they were checking quite effectively. They were checking uh, many people who that come uh, by plane into the country. And so they registered it, uh, this case in with this Iranian student. And it was actually reported quite fast, uh, unlike probably all other cases. And uh, they were actually showing off a lot of... Uh, activity around this like everybody knew that uh, they stopped the uh, the lectures at this university for two weeks for all the people uh, then uh, they like took this um, the students they would be going and like covering like media was covering how how he survives how he's recovering and so on and uh, they were checking all of his um classmates, groupmates, and uh, the relatives, his girlfriend, and so on. So they were giving a, a big, uh, basically a big performance of how well they are at detecting uh, the cases and how good they are at basically keeping it under, like in the bubble, so it doesn't go further. But I think... Uh, um, uh, later, I think a few days later, there would be another case found in uh, Vitebsk, which is a regional town, with regional city. And it was uh, from a woman who just came from Italy. And uh, basically every day there would be like one more, one more, one more person. And uh, I think people already by then, it was like the beginning of March and people already somehow knew the news, you know, like they they saw that something is going on in Italy and the Western states and so on. And they knew how people reacted, like basically all the propaganda about trying to distance yourselves and like wear, wear masks and so on. It was on the news, but on the news about the Europe, right? So there was basically no, um, like there was no... Um, calls from the government to, you know, like be cautious or to change something in your behavior. So it was basically told us that everything is being taken care of. And I think it actually was from the very beginning because uh, they were actually preparing because, uh, I mean, I don't know how, how well they are friends with China at the moment, but I think they probably got some um, exchange of information about how to prepare and they had this time. Um, and uh, of course, uh, in Minsk, there's much more uh, um, basically places uh, or beds in the uh, hospitals to put people, uh, unlike in the regions. And uh, so, and, and usually also <laughs> um, they would take people uh, with the suspicion of uh, COVID-19 in the night. So the, the emergencies would not come in the, in the, during the day. They would come at two in the night. This would like even scare people off more than this COVID-19. And uh, uh, I, I think we all saw this kind of casks, uh, like basically looks like uh, graves uh, for people that they put you inside this cask and transport you to the to the hospital. So the internet was kind of full of pictures that were taken by people who saw it uh, happening in the night and so on. And uh, I checked the amount of people uh, reported. Uh, the cases reported is now about 40,000 and uh, only uh, 242 people, uh, 224 people died. So basically you can see that it's almost no one died, uh, while a lot of people are um, are are infected and i think uh, i was not really like super much following the developments because uh, yeah i felt that there's also a lot of panic about it and uh, i was also quite skeptical about this quarantine measures that people were like from the very beginning people like they got one person infected and everybody uh, is demanding that we need quarantine which is really weird so people were uh, i mean um, asking for this uh, basically totalitarian measures uh, just because 
you know, they wanted to, they st- didn't want to study, you know, they didn't want to go to, to school and so on. So it was re- a bit weird. And I actually didn't like these intentions because I knew that I don't want to be like in Moscow where I have to have a special quote to go out, uh, you know, or to register my place of uh, residence and so on. Um yeah, so at the moment, uh, there's very different uh, messages that the government and the ministries are sending. So basically, the government and, uh, of course, the president is sending the message that everything is under control. We know what we're doing and basically you don't have to care. While the ministries, uh, I mean, the Ministry of Education, the Ministry of Health and so on, they are a bit more tactful you know about this so they are talking a a little bit more detailed information about how to protect but at the same time they of course they have to follow the line and basically it's very uh, contradictory uh information so one person who is all the time speaking from the tv and who is the head of the state says that you don't have to give a fuck while the others say hey you have to take these measures you know and uh of course on the on, on the whole level of uh, the state, there's no um, measures taken or like restrictions taken against anyone. So none of the restaurants or none of the service providers have been closed or like forced to be closed uh, or asked even to be closed. Uh, everything is supposed to work. But of course, people have started to self-isolate, basically. So they are using the social distancing and they are self-isolating. So people stopped going uh, going out. People stopped using hairdressers and so on. So basically, uh, what happened here is that the government effectively prevented itself from ha- helping businesses or like people in general, workers, uh, to pay them for uh, closure of their businesses, you know, because uh, now the, nowadays 70% of the restaurants, I think they are not working or working two days a week because they don't have customers while uh, they are not like the people who are, who have been fired are not fired because of COVID, I mean, allegedly, and they're not receiving any support, uh, which is basically a, a good gameplay. So you don't close anything and then you just say, okay, they just close by themselves, you know, so uh, this is why we don't need to do anything about it. All right. And you were saying that um, there are certain recommendations um, that are given by the state. I've heard um, there were these recommendations to drink vodka and drive tractor. Um, How did the perception of, I mean, the president is playing quite a huge role in Belarus. Um, How did the perception of the state change? Because, um, for example, in US, we've seen that... um, from the beginning, Trump was saying, okay, there is no COVID-19 or, okay, there is one, but there will be zero tomorrow. Um, did the government actually like, or let's say the most um, anti-COVID-19 parts of the government, like president, um, did they now accept it and say, yes, it happens, or it's still like we are going to drive the tractors and eat potato and go healthy? Um, well, I think, uh, yeah, you can always lo- watch any presentation <laughs> by our president, any statement, and you can find this stupid uh, uh, imp- uh, phrases that he's saying. Um, of course, this is not something that, uh, like I said, the ministries recommend something else. They are not saying <laughs> drink vodka and go to tractors. And uh, a lot of people produced a lot of memes about this. And I think on average, people... I mean, people I know or people in Minsk, at least, they are not uh, the ones who believe what the president says. While on the other hand, I think there's a lot of people, I think there's this kind of uh, a little bit like Soviet or like post-Russian uh, um Uh, culture where you have to be like super brave and not being afraid of the stupid shit that is like flying in the air that nobody sees you know so it's kind of brave to not wear a mask you know like and to kind of challenge it uh 
And uh, I think this is something that can be present in the society as well. That is like you're basically denying it. And I think for me, for a lot of people who are uh, who don't know how to deal with stress, you know, or who don't know how to deal with difficulties it might involve uh, to them, they are open um, to do th things like that, like just go in uh, and drink vodka and say that okay, uh, this is what our president told us. But of course, they're not believing this is a medicine. Uh, but at the same time they are kind of uh, showing off that uh, they are the ones who will never catch the disease you know and uh, this is also very funny uh, how it works with the church um, leaders that uh, are actually actively uh, prop um, propagated coming to churches instead of uh, being like go going out of them uh, because they said that okay look we were going to tuberculosis uh, rehab centers for 10 years you know or to the prisons with the people who have uh, an open form of tuberculosis and we were like doing this uh, church thing where you have to eat from the from the same uh, spoon you know and we were doing it with them and we have never been uh contagious like it's not contagious because we believe in god so much so you have to be just believe in god so much as to not uh catch the covid19 and this is very funny because these people were calling to come to easter ser uh, services and then uh, it was reported that 100 of the monks uh, like female monks uh, nuns uh, were uh, just uh, under uh, suspicion of having covid19 so probably they didn't believe too much right so um basically i would say that uh, now the president's rhetoric has changed uh he's not on um, any more recommending to drink anything or or drive the tractor he just says that okay uh we're doing everything possible but who knows what's gonna happen you know so he's, he's changed this rhetoric and like we don't know like we can like we we are controlling the disease but who knows what's, what happens tomorrow so he's uh, opening up a little bit of possibility that it can go crazy but uh, uh, basically it's not his responsibility um you said at the beginning that um the statistics seem pretty low um how does they match the reality is it somehow i don't know are there any informations who is actually like how high could be the numbers actually and which groups are actually mostly affected by that right now Is this somehow known to you? Uh, well, I I think I everyone can only speculate, like um, because uh, the thing is. Uh, One good thing was that uh, we got like a delegation from the World Health Organization invited to the country. I think it was in April. And when they came, actually, I think that was the time, like this three or five days that they were there and they visited different institutions, uh, health health centers. They uh, The statistics was the most correct because they were like reporting exact numbers and uh wh when they were in the country the statistics started to be like looking like real you know so around 500 people every day uh infected uh five people dead you know so it looks like you know one two percent death rate is okay but at the moment uh when they left they continued reporting infected cases and they were saying okay look uh we are now reporting almost 1000 a week uh a day sorry but um at the same time this is only because we're making a lot of tests while we are reporting Uh, the dead people the thing is with the dead people i think the first dead person was uh, found uh, in the beginning of march and it was not reported by the state it was reported by someone from the relatives to the media so as soon as the media reported it they started reporting as well and i think in the first days uh, only the media was the ones who was actually asking uh, actively asking people to send them information about newly infected newly uh, about dead people if 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 people had any and at the moment for example there is a uh, somebody uh, some uh, media is uh, making a special list of people who died among the medics and uh, like some kind of a mem memorial list or something and i think now it counts around 20 people which is uh, 10% of uh, who of 
everyone who died in in the country, which is much more than in every other country uh, according to the statistics. While because in Italy, I think it was like three uh, percent dead among medics, and uh, I don't know. I, I think that it's not ten percent in the end. It's much more. But uh, the fact is that when you're asking me who is the most um, well, I'm going to just comment on uh, what I think about the numbers. I think generally 40,000 is kind of closer to the reality because when it was 1,000, I didn't know anyone who among like in my circles or in my wider circles who would be ill, you know, or sick. Now I know quite some people who got sick, uh, maybe already, uh, um, you know, like recovered, but I, I don't know anyone who died. Um, one of my, per, uh, one of my, um, former university classmates at school, she works at the special lab where they are making these PCR tests. And she said, uh, somebody died at, uh, at her place, uh, like where she works. So, but, but it's not reported like, uh, sh- she was reported as dying of pneumonia. So a lot of things are not reported because they're not reporting other diseases, uh, although they were uh, much uh, like harshened by the COVID and basically it's the COVID death, but they're not counting it as, as one. Um, and coming to the question of who is uh, most um, um, stricken by it, uh, again, even uh, we don't know even the statistics, the actual statistics of uh, cases in the regions. Uh, I tried to find some and uh, the last uh, data comes from the 24th of April, you know, so it's al- almost a month they have not reported uh, the numbers in the regions. And of course, Minsk was heading, you know, like it was uh, maybe 40% of everything. Then the Vitebsk region uh, occupied 20% and then uh, each of the smaller uh regions uh, that got uh, some numbers. And uh, if we speak about uh, the social, you know, like population, uh, who could be, who might be uh, suffering most, I think these are people who live actually in the regions, in the villages, because I'm coming from uh, like a small village. And for example, at our place, you have to travel five kilometers to the nearest local uh, health center, which is not like, which has just general practitioner, maybe a dentist and uh, like a, uh, like a child doctor that's it in order to get uh, better uh, support health support you need to travel another 20 kilometers to the district center and in this district center they yeah they can forward you to Minsk for example so basically what happens is uh, I expect that pe- many people are are sick but they're not traveling to the health centers because uh, at the moment uh, they're not like basically it's better to sit at home you know uh, and many people are actually doing it because uh, uh, the health system, although it's free in Belarus, but it's not uh, access so much accessible. Like you can travel, but then you're losing one day of work. You know, just to be, uh, uh, just to be, uh, to get an appointment with a doctor, and it doesn't me- mean that you are getting there because now you have to be queuing a lot. You know, so basically, a lot of people just kind of do this self medication at home, and I think what happens is that people are not. Uh, reporting the early symptoms, those who live in the regions, and they are all, all already taken by the emergencies when it's already fucked up and then they can die, you know, because it's already too late. And uh, another thing is that I'm, uh, I was communicating with a person who lives in Minsk region, but who has, you know, like quite, uh, who is paid quite uh, small salary. And the thing is that although the medical care is free, and for example, if you're tested positively for COVID, you are getting uh, in the infectious uh, clinic, and then of course they're paying for your medication. But what they're doing now is that basically they're putting more and more people to be uh, sick at home, which is okay. But on the other hand, people should have money to buy their medication. And uh, this person that I was talking to, his mother got infected with pneumonia. He's got infected with something very similar because he has difficulty breathing and high fever. They were not tested COVID at all because then like they would be, they have to get some medication and they were just put at home 
and told that they need to buy like very expensive antibiotics and just sit at home. And at the moment, he doesn't, he cannot pay for his internet. He cannot pay for his phone just because he has to buy all these medications and nobody's testing them for COVID, you know? So I think people who live in the regions, people who have like very small income, uh, who have now to pay because uh, for people who have small income, it means that they can only pay as much as they live on, you know, the, uh, the, every emergency. And in this case, emergency is illness, uh, gets like a lot from your pockets, you know, so you, you, you have to start, uh, you know, asking, borrowing money, asking around because you're just not, uh, your salary is just not meant for that. And I think there's a lot of uh, people like that outside Minsk. So basically I think although people in Minsk are, there's more people in Minsk who are sick, but these people have more uh, access to health system. And also I think they are, of course, they are much more, um, um, they have bigger income so they can probably survive. So basically like usually the center would, uh, you know, like would survive and while the regions would uh, just probably count more deaths at the, at the end. Mm -hmm. Okay, this um, sounds pretty fucked up, actually. Um, I was wondering, because you already mentioned that um, there were no restriction from the state in closing down the businesses. And um, but on the other hand, there you said people were um, fired even so with different reasons. And you also mentioned that people don't even, if they even have a salary, that this is not enough money to pay. Um, how is the, the situation right now affecting the people? I mean, how many people are fired and how do people deal with that? Like um, how affects this also the economic situation in the country? Uh, well, again, we don't have the statistics. Uh, they reported, I think uh, they reported the... Um, unemployment rates in March and it was about 4% which is uh, just officially uh, while at the same time uh, there were some people who were trying to research and try to kind of make some uh, prognosis uh, and uh, there was some um, I had checked yesterday and there was uh, um, someone like some kind of scientist who was uh, propo uh, proposing uh, the number of 13 percent uh, of unemployment rate by the end of this year because of course now uh, we have been just two months in this crisis and we don't know it's not over yet and uh, basically it's going to be probably beating people further uh, in, in the year. And uh, 13% uh, actually means uh, almost half, uh, you know, like half a million people. So basically it's, uh, it's a lot. And uh, uh, the thing is that uh, at the moment, of course, like I said, there's a lot of people who lost their jobs at the restaurants and like in general in the food uh, chains. Uh, many people have changed uh, to, from, from being waiters to being delivery people because now a lot of them are working on deliveries. Uh, some people were, yeah, they were fired or asked to, to go on unpaid leave which is uh, something that you can do, but, and then basically you're not uh, protected in any way. And uh, yeah, of course, a lot of things like, just like gyms, uh, hairdressers, everything that is not basic uh, service, like basic service, like food, or um, I don't know, some, some things you have to buy in the, in the shop uh, or the medicine and so on. So basically everything, uh is is being closed down or like on the many businesses have closed down or just uh stopped for two months on in like expecting that there's gonna be some uh um some improvements but at the same time and uh, for the moment there have not been any help to any of the businesses or people uh they have signed a few of the decrees uh in support of the mostly state enterprises so at the moment there's uh only a few of these decrees that uh, first of all they are granting 
some kind of uh, holidays uh, for the rent. Uh, if you're renting uh, a space in, uh, I mean, not rent the housing rate, but the business rate rent. Uh, if you're renting something from the state, you are granted like half a year of uh, holidays, you know, so you don't have to pay and then you have to pay the rest uh, in small chunks. This is, but this only works with the state uh, facilities. While many people are uh, are renting from uh, from private enterprises and they're not uh, received any uh, any short uh, decrease, then they also uh, have um, supported uh, the people who work in the state uh, enterprises. So at the moment, they said that uh, the people who work uh, for state budget organizations they have to receive uh, at least the minimal uh, salary even uh, if there is um, like under um, like smaller or shorter working week or if they are going to be uh, uh, stopped like if the production is stopped for some time so these people would receive it but and and then uh, the, the state is providing subsidies to such enterprises while all the other enterprises which is uh, so the private businesses now are the majority uh, of uh, business in in Belarus which they're not receiving anything um, some people like the sole individual entrepreneurs uh, they received uh, some uh, tax uh, relaxation you know but it's not canceling it's just kind of you don't have to pay now your your deadline is extended and so on they are talking a little bit about increasing the in unemployment um, fee uh, unemployment um, um, what do you call it benefit now it's 20 uh, euros and they want to increase it to the minimum salary which is about 190 euros and i think they do it because they are expecting a lot of unemployment by the end of the year but of course this is only talks so this is conversations it's not uh, being decided yet and i think there's going to be also a lot of conditions on which you you will be able to receive such uh, such money mm, yeah i think we had this discussion in spain recently they were talking about this same thing that now they will have or they were discussing this kind of minimum salary but yeah with a lot of conditions the state is not going to present anything right now about the, the salary and also other things that the state that the Lukashenko's regime is doing I know that there will be elections in August how much of this is eventually pure kind of a populism and how much is it connected with the reality so does the Belarusian economy can afford to pay those uh, money to the people and does the Belarusian economy would be able to go with the tax um Uh, not evasion, but the lower taxes on on the on whatever they're taxa taxing right now. Um, well, I think no, it can't, uh, and this is why we, this, this is the clear reason why we're not uh, imposing quarantine because under quarantine or under lockdown measures, you need to pay to support people. Like in uh, many countries in the in the West, they receive eighty percent of the salary. Uh, you know, like people are, be, are working from home, uh, then uh, businesses are receiving some some of the dotations and so on. There is this tax relaxation and and, and stuff like that. And of course, uh, where do this money come from? Uh, I mean, the money that is coming from the social fund, right? So from some social security funds, which in our country is already in. Def 
deficit. So basically the pension and social uh, fund, uh, social uh, fund that is providing maternity leaves, you know, like some, uh, uh, some, some money when you're sick or, um, you know, like g- giving you money for the pension, it's already been in deficit for quite a while. So basically if, if now this uh, fund starts to pay uh, even minimum salaries to people who lost their jobs or who have to stop working for, I don't know, two or three months, it's going to be just over, <laughs> like Belarus is over. And um, this is why exactly they are trying to imitate this activity. Like they understand that uh, the amount of economical activity has slowed down. It has stopped uh, in many cases, but at the same time, it is, it's at least something, you know, so people are still continuing to buy and consume and maybe produce something. Uh, maybe, yeah. So also I just forgot to say, Uh, about the workers that I think um, you know that uh, many of Belarusian uh, working population uh, usually work as migrants in Poland uh, or Russia and at the moment because of this uh, lockdowns on the borders they I think there's uh, been a lot uh, of problems for them because they cannot travel and they cannot uh, go to work if or if they cannot go back to Belarus for example to uh, reunite with their families so I think this is also something that uh, the Belarusian economy or like the president is always uh, qu- um, arguing that these people are uh, the ones who are uh, basically betraying the motherland and not paying taxes but at the same time the incomes of these people that they are sending to their families is a big uh, percent of Belarusian economy which is probably now not going on. Uh, as for the uh, elections I think uh, I wouldn't say this is something um, that he at the moment that he, this is something that all these decrees of support is something that he's doing in order to uh, be elected I think because it's so small that is not even considered to be something nice. I don't know, like if everybody received, I don't know, 100, 1000 euros uh, at once, maybe it would be uh, seen as a as a gesture uh, for the elections. At the moment, I think this is something that they're just trying to get on with what is going on. Maybe there is something behind it, but I haven't thought about it in this way. Uh, and yes, uh, I think uh, the fact is that they have uh, placed these elections on the 9th uh, of of August is also really weird because uh, on the one hand uh, Lukashenko is the person who would be really willing to actually lock down everyone like he's uh, <laughs> very much uh, in favor of uh, restrictive measures and uh, usually he does like I think he would be really happy if he, if he would be able to lock everybody down at homes and uh, everybody's mouths shut up but uh, he's not doing it and he's playing this liberal person like and also they all the time comparing in the propaganda Belarus to Sweden. Like, look, there's also one Western state, which is a very liberal and very health, uh, wealthy, and they're also not imposing any lockdown. Look, we are going the same way, which is, of course, uh, I mean, it, it's a little bit similar, but on the other hand, uh, the context is also very different. different. And uh, um, so basically, uh, now he's playing uh, this liberal guy. And at the same time, um, I think during elections, he could use this situation, like this kind of uh, epidemic situation in in favor of, for example, forbidding mass demonstrations or something like that. I think because they can play the numbers, it could be also the fact that they could... Uh, you know, play out the peak of epidemics or something like this, you know? So they say, okay, now in August, there's like super ma- many people that are getting infected. We need to close down for one week, you know? And and this is going to work because, uh, because they have all the, uh, the, all the resources, human resources and, and, and the money for that. So I think this is uh, on the one hand, they start, they're playing with this football, you know, championship, they're playing with the parade showing that, you know, they're not going to, um, stop or forbid any mass uh, gatherings while at the same time I think even tomorrow he can change his mind you know and it's, it's going to be his way anyway So while Belarus is on its way to become Sweden and first time <laughs> in, in the history would get its own sea 
which is a really huge complex I've heard in Belarus. Um, this story with the parade, I think everybody heard about it because it was really weird. Um, why do you think it actually was so important for Lukashenko? Because I've heard that Putin, even Putin said, okay, we're not going to do our parade this year. Um, why did it happen? And what was the reaction actually of the society? Did everybody were like, yay, we need tanks when the virus is in our city or more like a more critical perception? Did it somehow affect the situation at all? Well, um, I think uh, it was interesting to think about it because um, I think nobody... I don't know people to, who actually go to parades. Mostly these are people who are uh, told to go. Uh, I think that there are some people who would be uh, really willing to go. And, you know, like they also are really... Uh, nowadays, look look what's happening. Like, uh, even though there's no lockdown, like no, nothing... Um, um, but nothing is happening. Like there's no concerts, no parties, no nothing. Be just because the institutions, like the clubs or, you know, they decided to stop it by themselves, you know, because they don't want to contribute to this pandemic. Or maybe they, yeah, they were given maybe some instructions which are under the table. I don't know. But on the other hand, uh, people really want to hang out, you know. So basically for them, this mass, get mass gathering with uh, the music and stuff like that is probably one way to just not sit at home and to see something uh, you know something different from what they're seeing every day because life has become so boring and uh, maybe that um, and but on the other hand I really felt uh, upset and I really felt sorry for the people that uh, work with this uh, budget organizations with the state enterprises because I'm sure they were told to go And uh, I know a few people were complaining about the fact that they're really afraid, but they have to go. Otherwise, they're lo losing the jobs. So basically, they have to, uh, while they are be receiving these dotations, like I told you, right? They are kind of the people who would be protected just in case. But on the other hand, uh, they have to support all this spectacle, you know, all this performance and support it with their lives, with their health and so on, which is really horrible. And uh, on the other hand, uh, one person told me a very interesting idea about why the parade actually happened. I mean, one of the reasons behind it. Because in, in our country, many, um, um, many state uh, activities in general are happening because there are some schemes behind them. So basically everything is decided like half a year before. So all the state contracts have been sold already to kind of other contractors, the corrupt contractors that would, I, for example, like they were saying that the scene, uh, the construction of the scene for the uh, parade cost about 300,000 euros, like the installation and the whole shit. So basically... You can imagine that the contract for this scene, for the installation, was sold half a year ago, you know. So it's already been paid for, for example. It's been ordered it's and so on. And uh, everything else is as well. So they have already invested so much money in all this uh, shit. They now have to play it just because otherwise <laughs> there's going to be a collapse inside this uh, gray scene, you know, that we don't see. And I think this is a very interesting idea why it could happen, why everything in our country happens like that because none of the state contracts is awarded uh, uh, by uh, contest uh, basis. They are always uh, announcing, that, okay, look, there is a tender for this and that. And for example, they give you three days to apply for the tender while you have to provide documents that are even being made within 10 days. So it means that nobody can actually apply for the tender, but there's always some winner. And of course, they are announcing the tenders just for the specific people, and they are announcing specific terms for the for the people to win in the tender. So I think there could be also some uh, some financial interest behind all this parade, even though we see it as a waste of money. And of course, this is a waste of people's money, but for them, it's not waste. It's uh, it's a gain. Yeah. Okay. Um, 
Yeah, sounds incredible. Um, at least with this, Belarus was really unique this year. The only parade in the 70s. Well, the football. No, the I mean, football the only, was also a unique yes, thing. Yeah, that's true. But the only parade on the 75th anniversary of the end of the war. На президентских выборах в Беларуси победил Александр Лукашенко. И сегодня избранный глава государства провел пресс-конференцию для представителей белорусских и зарубежных Будет ли сидеть в тюрьме, э, Будут все сидеть в тюрьме по закону. Для этого у нас есть Мы следователь. нарушили всякие законы и законодательства. Когда закрывают за камеры двери, когда ты теряешь... анархистов с России приехали и другие были, мы там их обнаружили, там с нескольких стран люди были. Это не чисто белорусский был вариант. Сценарий один и тот же. Я же вас предупреждал, если начнется какая-то заварушка, то у нас горючего вещества хватает, чтобы его подбросить. Но я вас тоже предупреждал, ребята, вы не с тем связались. Я прятаться в подвале не буду. Поэтому Давайте на этом закончим. Закончим. Больше безглуздой демократии, бестолковой демократии в стране не будет. Мы не дадим растерзать страну. Мы знаем, чего это стоит. Yeah, apart from the parade, and you, we already touched a bit in general the situation about the people, but... Mm, how does actually the situation right now, how would you say, affect the society? How does people interact with each other? Do people support each other? Um, like here, for example, there were a lot of networks where people were offering help for people who couldn't go, for example, to the supermarket or, I don't know, did go out with the dogs in the neighborhood because people were maybe... Uh, especially um, threatened by this whole COVID. So are there any kind of those um, organi self-organization attempts in, uh, in Belarus as well? Yeah, I think, uh, yeah, our society is not an exception to the general <laughs> instinct of people to help each other. Uh, and I think, yes, there was some, uh, some nice gestures. And I think we cannot really know if some of them were um genuine or like very sincere while others would be more like a peer uh gestures for example they have been uh, already from the beginning the government opened like a charity uh account collecting money for the um for producing uh, protective gear gear for the medical medic, uh, medical workers and uh, a lot of businesses like maybe 10 of the most uh, uh, richest <laughs> businesses in Belarus, like IT or maybe some oil companies and so on, they donated like $100,000 
you know, in one yeah. day. And I think this is, uh, I, I don't know, like it looked for me that they were sent some emails saying that, hey, look, there's an account. And I mean, we encourage you to pay. And uh, I think probably it would be also like an excuse for them to continue working just w when the pandemic is over, you know? So uh, maybe it, it was a sincere gesture. I don't know, but it looked like very good performance as well. Yeah. Uh, on the other hand, uh, some taxi uh, services, the, they started um, the campaign of um, um, free uh, rides for medical workers. Uh, then there was also uh, a few uh, hotels that are, of course, they're empty. Uh, these hotels decided to that they can host uh, some of the um, some of the medical workers that cannot go home because uh, they can in infect uh, their you know some some children or some grandparents that are at home. Uh, and uh, I don't know as well if if it was something they wanted to do or if they were ordered to do that. Um, there's a lot of crowdfunding campaigns at the moment running uh, asking for collecting money for the protective gear uh, there's also a lot of some some something like hack hacker space initiatives which are producing 3d printing uh, of uh, this uh, protective screens and so on and then they are collecting money for that and then they uh, involve people who would uh, be driving uh, the resources um, here and there so there's a uh, kind of these uh, um, structures exist, these networks, a lot of uh, uh, chats, a lot of uh, channels on Telegram, for example, where people are coordinating. There's also like a map of people who can volunteer so they can map themselves on the map and uh, see if there's like a need around or maybe they can say what they can offer. I don't know if it works uh, well or not, but at least it, it does. Then there was uh, some of the restaurants decided to stop producing food for the population, but uh, started cooking for medics uh, and delivering food for medics. Uh, there's also some crowdfunding for the homeless people, for the animals, uh, many businesses and many like social Mm, for example, social spaces uh, like cultural centers and uh, so on. They uh, started uh, a campaign uh, that is called Art. Um, how do you say it in English? Uh, like basically, they invite people to pay what they would have paid for the transport fee and to pay them. Like just because nobody is now uh, going there and nobody is renting spaces from them, but they still need to the money to collect for the rent. So they, um, yeah, ask the people to uh, uh, to pay for this art bus pass. They call it uh, basically you, you the, the the money you would be spending on the bus pass. Otherwise, you could pay to them. And I think it's just, it is nice. Uh, there's also uh, yesterday I saw a really nice uh, uh, announcement from the vegan um, the fast food, uh, monkey food. Uh, they announced that they are going to uh, provide free uh, lunches every day to people who have lost their job in the food service like those who have lost their jobs among waiters and cooks and so on, they can come and they would be fed for free in the, in this vegan fast food. I think this is a really nice uh, example of how they could be so in solidarity with the people like them. And uh, yeah, and I think it's also a very good uh, move <laughs> in terms of showing how this kind of altruist uh, things could stay uh, despite of all this uh, a little bit of panicking and trying to to, you know like get more resources to yourself like buy more paper and so on instead of helping uh, each other i think it really sounds actually quite um yeah i don't know i i when i kind of um read about all the different situations in the different countries i had the feeling in all those places where the state is kind of yeah stepping back and trying not to really um take it serious or maybe in a yeah, in a weird way that this was the moment where actually there was the space that the people started self-organizing because they were aware because it's about their life. And this opens a lot of space for people to organize, which usually is not happening in daily life. 
So maybe we could see this also as something positive. Yeah, I agree. And I actually, like I said, I'm not uh, I'm not a proponent of the lockdown, actually. I know it's it makes sense uh, in many situations. Maybe it makes sense uh, here as well. But on the other hand, I think... Uh, Yeah, basically lockdown and restricting uh, freedoms is never an option. And it's, I don't know if we want to trade our health for the further uh, restoration of basically like really weird regimes with all the stupid apps that are tracking you and so on. So I, I don't know if I want to trade my health uh, to that. And um, yeah, so basically, uh, I, I know that in Moscow, for example, there's a lot of uh, problems for the volunteers and for the people who wanted to help because, just because they cannot move now, you know. And this is why I'm really happy that there's no lockdown here, because uh, these uh, all these uh, communities and all these uh, initiatives can can develop. They can meet. They can you know like talk to each other. They can help each other instead of just sitting at home and I don't know doing something online, which is Uh, which also makes sense but still so um yeah i don't know the real numbers i don't know the yeah maybe i'm also a little bit like corona dissident uh and maybe i was uh, the first time in 20 years a little bit supportive of when lukashenko said it's not going to be quarantine just because i knew that i i really yeah i really don't want it and uh Yeah, I think uh, when people demand uh, quarantine or lockdown, this is also something that they just don't understand how it's going to influence other people, how it's going to influence, I don't know, uh, all the people that are vulnerable, uh, like migrants, like people who only can uh, earn in the street, for example, like homeless people and so on. And, and without the support, And of course, nobody's going to provide support to these people. Uh, it's going to just be much more horrible. And uh, yeah, I think it's good when people are being moved to home-based work. But uh, I think uh, Belarus is now not really uh, ready for that, at least in the state enterprises and uh, even in the in the um, in the commercial ones. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah. On the other, on the one hand, also I'm very critical to uh, to this no notion of this homework. You know, like this work from home uh, thing. I really hated all these uh, nice posts on Facebook. How boring they are. Uh, how boring. How bored they are to be working from home. And uh, you know, like what uh, you're gonna do? How do you make fun when you're working from home? What the fuck? I mean, it's just because you're privileged that you can work from home. And like nobody, not everyone works in a fucking office, you know, to be able to work from home and other people uh, just like you have to either lose their job or they have to work and get infected and stuff like that while you are thinking about which series you want to watch, you know. So I really hated this uh, attitude of uh, and it was very, very middle class attitude, like okay, we can just impose lockdown and it's gonna like, and we're gonna just be healthy and happy, which yeah. is not fucking true, you know? And uh, yeah, so I think um, now at the moment, people are, are a little bit tired actually of, there was a lot of people among my friends who would be self-isolating from the very beginning. And I really hated it because they were self-isolating when there were like 50 people in the country that were infected and they would not meet you and so on and now when it's almost two months in the in isolation they are already tired so people are starting going out they start meeting while it's now now it's actually the time when they have to self-isolate but uh, of course nobody can survive uh, such a long time in uh, like in individualizing or like very atomized way Yeah, totally. Yeah, yeah. Um, I uh, have one more question about. Um, yeah, maybe you mentioned already there are people who can work at home, or even people who can choose. There are a lot of people who cannot choose where they actually are, and I was wondering in a lot of um, countries there were. Um, situations where people in prison were actually rising up against the situation because um, there were a lot of restrictions and um, people were also afraid that the coronavirus spreads into the prison. And we know that Belarus is a country with a really high um, prison population. And I was wondering 
um, if you know anything about the situation in the prisons in Belarus, actually? Mm. Unfortunately, not much, because uh, like I said, they're not providing any information about uh, who exactly was infected. Because, for example, I'm reading the Russian news and re yesterday they were providing inf statistics on how many guards, prison guards and how many prisoners were infected. And it's actually uh, almost 1000 guards and only 200 uh, prisoners. And uh, basically in Belarus, you don't know how many and who exactly is infected uh, plus uh, I, I i know only one uh, or a few news uh, about prohibiting of visits uh, in uh, in the prisons from par parents or and even lawyers which i think is uh, a very bad you know like situation for the prisoner uh, where they cannot meet their defense or where they cannot meet meet their relatives but at the same time um yeah, basically, I don't know if it's an effective measure or because any guard can just come and go, you know, and then bring the disease inside. So it's not really <laughs> always controllable. And uh, until now, there have not been any news I know of about any, I don't know, rebellions or any unrest in prisons about that and or even among the relatives outside. I don't know, maybe for many people it kind of seems reasonable or many people just understand that nobody cares less for for prisons if uh, like everybody cares for something else now you know so yeah. there's no uh, space for talking about these people who are usually not taken care of uh, in in normal situation all right and what is interesting for me is that in many states or let's say in many places in the world where the state is failing and the people are taking over the state infrastructure and i mean the strong man or whatever you call it are not really happy with that is in belarus this self-organization um, somehow tolerated or there are actually repressions against the people who are trying to self-organize or i mean which I can't imagine, but maybe this is the case. Belarus is a Belarusian state is actually helping the self-organized initiatives to get to to the streets and help people. Well, I don't. I haven't heard about any direct repressions like like forbidding them to do something. I think now is the time when like most people, what they're doing is basically they're not doing any political work. They're just doing a uh, kind of social support or social care work, uh, producing more protective gear. And of course, medics don't have to gear and the state knows it. So it's not the, the, the area where they could even uh, compete with uh, with each other because it's just not enough and this is why i think the state doesn't like the fact that then uh, all these activists are also reporting that uh, while the state says that everybody is equipped uh, when they come to smaller or even bigger hospitals all the medics claim that they have not been equipped, you know, or they have uh, not enough equipment. And I think, uh, of course, the state doesn't like it because uh, then these activists know some uh, like closer the situation. They know uh, firsthand. And a lot of medics are also very tired and they are also quite open to talking now because they also see a lot of uh, um, basically uh, lying, you know, because in, on the TV they were they are it's it's told that the medics are receiving additional money that they are receiving all the necessary protection that they are receiving enough rest and so on well this is not the case and i think medics are being uh very angry uh in many cases and i think there was only one case when a medic that was uh, a video uh, uh where he was uh, uh reporting the situation in his uh, small town uh, he was arrested um, for some days, of course, not directly for this video, but just because he was a little bit too active and a little bit too open about uh, what is happening. And of course, most medics do not do that. Like they are not really open to talking to me and uh, yeah, or they, or they want to do it uh, anonymously. 
and so on. So I think that's just uh, receiving this as supportive help, while because they just because they know that any or any day that could they could shut that down, and it's not going to be very difficult. All right, and in many countries we have seen that anarchists or anti-authoritarian activists actually are playing an important role in the self-organization networks. What is the answer to the coronavirus in Belarus from the anarchist movement, from the anti-authoritarian part of the political scene? Well, I think there have not been any effective answer i think uh, I, I i wouldn't say there was was even like a very uh wide discussion about this in in this case and i think anarchists are also people and uh, a lot of people are you know like they are afraid to be infected they are stressed uh, they are also very stressed about losing their jobs and so on and i think now a lot of people e inside the movement have all concentrated more on their domestic issues like how to survive how to you know like not get infected many people do not want to come to the meetings because they are Um, they are yeah, proposing not to meet anymore or not to meet at least now and so on. So uh, I think nowadays it's really difficult to gather uh, amount, the amount of people you would like to do something with. While, uh, of course, uh, there's not so much to do, actually. And I know that some individual anarchists are uh, just joining Uh, all these uh, social care uh, initiatives that exist. So some of them go and uh, print, uh, help printing the uh, protective screens. Some of them who have a car, they are having the deliveries and stuff like that. So I think basically it's more like something that you do on the individual level. There's some people that are a little bit more popular online. They have created like a specific uh, chat on uh, mutual aid and so on but i'm not sure if this is something that is basically becoming very viral that uh, could uh, become like a force so basically it's just a little bit of communication and cooperation with some people um yeah i think um, yeah the only discussion that was there is that people were actually all the, all, all of them were against the restrictive measures like against the lockdowns and and so on because just because of course uh, anarchists are the people who don't want to expose their place of living who don't want to expose who don't want to download apps yeah so for them it's another repressive measure and uh, they yeah they were propagating against it Okay, thanks a lot for yeah all the information you shared with us and the situation you are right now. And yeah, a lot of strength to go through this and hopefully hopefully it will, yeah, I don't know, change soon that people can freely meet again and not so many people have to suffer from that. Okay, thank you. And thanks for doing this. I'm really uh, looking forward to listen to other accounts from, from different countries. It's, it's interesting. And that was it for today. Thanks for listening. You can find the archive of our radio shows on the website of the Anarchist Network Dresden. Elephant in the Room is a proud member of Channel Zero Network, an English-based anarchist radio podcast network run by radical media makers from around the world.